Two years ago, when the world was hit with a novel coronavirus, it was just one of a few times that humans have come into contact with this pathogen. Or was it? Dan Werb is an epidemiologist and assistant professor at the University of Toronto and University of California, San Diego. His new book maps the path that brought COVID-19 into our lives. It's called The Invisible Siege, The Rise of Coronaviruses and the Search for a Cure. And he joins us now from St. Michael's Hospital in the downtown core of Ontario's capital city to explain this mystery. Dan, it's great to have you on the program. How are you managing? I'm well, I'm well. Thanks for having me back. Not at all. Here we go. Let's go back to 2003. This is from your book. The revelation you write that SARS was a coronavirus had implications that went far deeper than the epidemic the world faced in 2003. Coronaviruses were simply not a threat to humans, and they were certainly not supposed to be capable of producing strains that infected 8,000 people across the globe and killed roughly 10% of them. In the world of virology, coronaviruses were docile creatures, known for causing common colds and infecting animals. They had, as far as anyone knew, never been anything but a largely innocuous family. Okay, Dan, SARS took us by surprise in 2003, but you think it shouldn't have, right? Was this not its first appearance? Yeah, so at the time when SARS emerged, there were two known coronaviruses that could infect humans. And, and as you read in that excerpt, um, they both caused just common colds. Um, it seemed like a very stable family, a family that didn't change much. Uh, and that, you know, even when SARS emerged, uh, which we thought of as the first, you know, pathogenic human coronavirus, it was understood as kind of a, just an aberration of nature, just something that was uh, entirely... Um, you know, a coincidence um, and not some kind of uh, comment or, or reflection on the ability of the, of the family to jump from species to species and to become dangerous. Now, in the wake of SARS, there was some really interesting work done um, by scientists using something called molecular clock analysis, which is basically a way to th go through the speed of mutations that viruses um, uh, produce and kind of follow the thread of mutations back to the moment when a particular viral strain first branched off from its closest relative. And using this technique, uh, coronavirologists went back and discovered that there was one of these known uh, coronaviruses that uh, now in, you know, just only cause common colds had actually emerged in the 1890s. Uh, and they pinpointed the date to, you know, the end of uh, uh, between 1889 and 1890. Now, what's remarkable about that moment in time is that it's exactly when something called the Russian flu pandemic swept across the globe. And this was a pandemic that uh, killed a million people. Uh, and as its name suggests, it was commonly understood to be a flu. Uh, and it was only much later uh, after uh, the advent of SARS, that it seems like that was potentially actually a coronavirus pandemic in disguise. How shocking a revelation was this to you and your colleagues? Uh, I, I I think it's it's pretty shocking, and and you know the further back you go with molecular clock analysis, you understand that um, you know the history of this vir viral family isn't counted in you know, thousands of years or 10,000s of years as, as it was commonly uh, believed, it actually potentially goes back as many as 300 million years. And that's a long time. And that's far, far before our species ever walked the earth. And so that suggests that, you know, rather than being something entirely new, coronaviruses might actually predate our own species, and that we're, you know, living in a coronavirus world, and we just happen to show up in it. So we're, boy, this reminds me of an old episode of Star Trek. We're the viruses, and they're actually the legit normal thing? Well, what's remarkable about coronaviruses is that, you know, rather than being these uh, stable, species-specific viruses, again, in the wake of SARS, some coronavirologists started to look at the capacity of these viruses to jump between species. And they found that rather than being stable, rather than being species-specific, Coronaviruses are actually incredible generalists. Now, what that means is they're able to uh, uh, take advantage of the same kinds of um, weaknesses and vulnerabilities 
that exist in a number of different species. And so, you know, for example, they to enter cells, uh, coronaviruses, um, you know, they essentially use their spike protein. The spike protein is engineered, you know, by nature to um, uh, to um, engage with a particular part of the cell wall. And and what's incredible is that this that part of the cell wall that a number of different coronaviruses attack is something that is common across not only human beings but across mice, but across a number of bat species. And so what you realize is that, you know, coronavirus, coronaviruses have actually been working on kind of picking the locks of our cells, not just uh, among humans, but among our ancestors for, again, for hundreds of millions of years, potentially. Um, and so when humans arrived on the scene, they were already primed to take advantage of the weaknesses in our in our system that had been there um, since before our species existed and were there with our ancestors. Well, let's make sure we understand because you told us a moment ago that that coronaviruses, at least previously, presented as nothing more than sort of the regular flu. What is the difference, in fact, between a, con a coronavirus and an influenza pandemic? So they're entirely separate viral families that um, operate in totally different ways. Uh, what's you know, the thing that sets uh, coronaviruses apart from other um, similar viruses is that they have these enormous genomes. And so there's two classes of viruses. Almost all viruses are RNA viruses. They use RNA to replicate. Uh, there's a small class of DNA viruses that use DNA to replicate. Of course, DNA is what all um, cellular and multicellular um, organisms use to replicate as well. RNA is this, unlike DNA, it's not hardy, it's very fragile and um, it's liable to mutate. And so it was commonly thought that RNA viruses couldn't have genomes that were too large because if they became too large, they would just have too many mutations um, when they replicated. It was just, you know, there would be too many spots on the kind of architecture where something could go wrong. So they had to have these very, very small genomes to allow them to, uh, to allow themselves to survive. However, coronaviruses had these massive genomes that were about a third or even you know almost twice as large as um, what was commonly believed to be physically possible in the world. So you know you talk to coronavirologists vir and they were like, these things should not have theoretically existed on planet Earth. Um, and so it's it's this massive genome that is at the heart uh, of what they're able to do and how they uh, set themselves apart from, from other uh, viruses. Okay, you mentioned Russia uh, a moment ago, a million deaths there. Take us back a thousand years to China. What did you find there? Yeah, so, you know, it's a, it, again, using this molecular clock analysis, um, there, there was another um, coronavirus strain called NL63 that, you know, nowadays, again, just causes a common cold. But using this molecular clock analysis, it was uh, uh, identified that it first emerged around a thousand years ago. And you know, the further back in time you get with molecular clock analysis, the the fuzzier the estimates are. So you know, for this book that I wrote, The Invisible Siege, that that chronicles sort of the rise of the coronavirus family and then the scientific response to it, leading into SAR, uh, into um, COVID nineteen and beyond. I went back and, and looked at, okay, what was happening in the 11th century um, when this uh, NL63 was first believed to have emerged? And again, when viruses first emerge and, and uh, intersect with new species, it's often when they're, you know, they, they're often not well um, uh, engineered to, to, uh, to replicate within those systems without damaging their hosts. So, that's a fancy way of saying they basically cause more dangerous outcomes. Now, what was going on in the 11th century, which is fascinating, is that China uh, had had emerged from hundreds of years of chaos into this dynasty called the Northern Song, which was sort of a high point of Chinese um, culture, economy, um, sophistication, and um, international trading. And it was also a point in time when 80 years of extreme epidemics racked the country. 
And so I went back and I looked at, um, you know, extant notes from physicians at the time, from uh, policies from uh, that were recorded by the Chinese court and discovered that there were a number of these epidemics that caused symptoms very similar to what a coronavirus is known to, to um, cause. And so, you know, it's far, far back in time. We will never know for sure whether it was a coronavirus that caused these, this wave of decades of, of um, you know, epidemics. Um, but it certainly seems like it could have been the case. And, and it's also sort of, I would say, a cautionary tale in what happens to societies when epidemics are uh, able to to just run unchecked, uh, and I'll I'll save you the spoiler, um, <laughs> you know the epidemics uh, ended up you know lasting longer than the Northern Song Dynasty itself. Hmm. Well, uh, if you want to talk about a cautionary tale, a lot of people regard SARS from 2003 as a sort of a dress rehearsal for what we're going through right now. So let's follow up on that. You make the comparison in the book about how countries that did experience SARS, like ours, formed a kind of a scar tissue that countries that didn't experience it, like the United States, um, that they didn't make. Why is that a significant distinction to make? Yeah, I, I, I think it's very, very significant. And this idea of scar tissue, you know, that points to trauma. SARS was a national trauma for Canada. It was a national trauma for China. It was a national trauma for Australia. Um, Vietnam. These were all countries that were deeply affected by SARS that saw normal life um, basically brought to a standstill in a lot of parts of the country. And I'll give you the, uh, you know, the example of Canada. In the wake of SARS, the Public Health Agency of Canada was formed. It was part of the um, sort of, you know, audit on what went wrong and what went right with SARS. And it was, it was decided that Canada needed a public health agency that could act very rapidly, very nimbly, and act flexibly to counteract a pathogenic threat if and when it emerged. Um, along with uh, the, the implementation of the Public Health Agency of Canada, there was also legislation passed that increased the power of medical officers of health to direct resources, to impose restrictions. And you know we've seen all of that come into play uh, in the response to COVID. And I would say early on, particularly, if you look at those countries, that experienced the trauma of SARS, and in the case of South Korea, experienced another coronavirus epidemic in Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, they were very, very well equipped to deal with the initial outbreaks and the initial epidemics through public health measures that they were able to rapidly uh, implement. And, and that's directly related to the fact that, you know, we went through this already as a country with SARS and we knew how, how serious uh, things could get. I'd like to follow up with the story of Ian Lipkin, who was the scientist who, I gather, invented the PCR test in the middle of the SARS crisis. We're going back to 2003. And you tell the story about how he was immediately flown to China to sort of show public officials, public health officials there, how to administer it, how to make it work. What do you think his experience 19 years ago taught us for today? So Ian Lipkin is a is a fascinating guy. Um, he so he didn't invite invent the PCR test writ large. He he invented this PCR test specific to detecting SARS. Um, he's better known in sort of the pop culture zeitgeist as the scientific consultant on the movie Contagion. So uh, if you like that, you you saw a little bit of Ian Lipkin in there. So Ian Lipkin, um, you know, was at the time one of, and, and is still one of the world's foremost um, epidemic scientists, pathogenic scientists, and, and had uh, early on in the epidemic sought to create this PCR test, this very, um, you know, highly granular, sensitive test that could detect SARS. Up until that point, um, there was no way to know who was being infected with SARS reliably. There were some early tests that, um, you know, sort of got halfway there, but there was no reliable test for, for SARS. And without a test, as we've all learned, you can't control an epidemic. If you don't know who has, who, who has been infected, you cannot impose restrictions. You cannot place people in quarantine. You can't do contact tracing and all of the kinds of things that are required to um, make sure that an outbreak doesn't metastasize into an epidemic and an epidemic transform into a pandemic. So early on um, in, in the SARS epidemic, Ian Lipkin created this new PCR test and was immediately flown to, Be to Beijing by the Chinese government 
where he was put on national TV and had to demonstrate on national TV to you know the entire Chinese populace um, that the tests actually worked and how to use them. And the introduction of that PCR test was along with some really incredible public health work done by the Chinese government at the time, um, you know, really consequential in turning the tide. And SARS, of course, didn't require a vaccine uh, to uh, stamp it out. Um, it was, we were able to draw, drive SARS back into the wild using only public health restrictions. There were never any vaccines uh, created to counteract uh, SARS. There were never any treatments that were developed to make people who were infected less ill. It was just purely public health um, measures, and they were powered in large part by accurate tests. Let's pivot to the business of infectious disease. And again, I'm going to read an excerpt from your book to get us started on this. By the 1950s, you write, morphine, penicillin, aspirin, insulin, and chemotherapy, along with vaccines for polio, measles, smallpox, and tuberculosis, have been developed by or in partnership with private pharmaceutical companies. But the sheer glut of life-saving medicines they produced in the first half of the 20th century left them with a choice. Either take a chance on more difficult goals, like vaccines for rare or emerging diseases, and risk costly failures, or use their library of intellectual property to make incremental improvements to existing products that were sure-fire moneymakers. By and large, they chose the safer route. For all humanity's awe-inspiring discoveries, our capacity to meet new viral threats had largely calcified in the face of ruthless market forces. Which raises the question, how do we get pharmaceutical companies to keep researching for vaccines um, if we find ourselves in the future not quite in the desperate circumstances we found ourselves in two years ago this week? It's a great question. And I think it's among the most consequential questions of our age. So, you know, I was speaking with a scientist, uh, uh, you know, last year, and he posed the question, what would you have paid me for a COVID vaccine in January 2018? The answer is nothing. Right. Because there was no SARS-CoV-2. There was zero incentive in the market to project out into the future to address threats that didn't yet exist. That's not the fart. That, that, that's not the the fault of um, pharmaceutical companies. That's simply the way that our system for making science uh, works. So I, I don't want to, um, you know, demonize pharmaceutical companies, um, but obviously the way in which scientific research happens in the for-profit arena doesn't make sense. We have a collective action problem here like so many of the problems that we're facing as a species. It is a collective action problem insofar as everybody agrees that there will be another pandemic potential pathogen that emerges. And, it, and, and we also know that it's going to emerge from one of the 26 viral families that are known to infect human beings. However, there's no agreement in developing vaccines or treatments that can deal with any of, uh, you know, strains from any of those viral families until they emerge. And that's, you know, on the flip side, we have still hundreds, hundreds, almost 300 pharmaceutical companies, research groups, biotech companies trying to develop a COVID vaccine now. Hmm. I mean, it, it's insane the way the market works. It's more profitable to continue to develop a COVID vaccine now when there are you know, so many already that are effective and on the market than it is to start predicting out into the future, knowing that there is going to be a future uh, pandemic potential pathogen that emerges and trying to create a representative vaccine that can get us you know, at least part of the way towards protecting our, our uh, species. So what's the alternative? So the alternative is to develop and support public Science. I mean, publicly funded science got us so far of the way in um, in in yeah. our response to COVID-19. And the thing about publicly funded science is that, you know, people are always saying, you know, or not people, often politicians when they're upset with uh, scientific funding saying, oh, why why are we studying this mosquito or why are we studying this 
um, arcane sort of benign viral family that has never been known to infect humans or cause them harm? Well, the reason is because we never know what's going to happen in the future. And so we need to take a broad approach and allow sort of the marketplace of ideas to proliferate um, based on good ideas and creative thinking rather than on what is going to be um, as profitable as possible in the short term. It's really the only way. So there, I mean, there's a few specific strategies by which you can do that. The first is, as I said, um, you can create vaccines for one strain of each of the 26 viral families known to infect humans. That, that is, you know, they call these kinds of things a moonshot, right? It is a large job, but it's not an impossibly large job. I mean, it's, it's constrained insofar as we know that there's only these many families and all we would need is one vaccine that works against one strain of each of those families. And we would be so well positioned at that point if a new pathogen emerged from one of those families to adapt the existing vaccine to that pathogen. So that's, that's one way of doing it. The other way, and, and of course that would have to be a publicly funded global effort. The other way to do that is to um, look at um, broad-based antiviral medicines and try to develop as many broad-based antiviral medicines as possible that can protect our species from existing viruses and future viruses. So I'll give you an example. There is this drug molnupiravir which uh, is one of the uh, FDA in the States, FDA approved drugs for uh, you know, disrupting the replication of um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Molnupiravir was developed and tested beginning in 2015. And it wasn't tested against SARS-CoV-2, of course, because the virus didn't yet exist. It was tested as a pan-coronavirus weapon. It was something that the people testing it realized, you know, it's, it, it is um, able to disrupt a particular part of the viral replication cycle. And that part of the viral replication cycle is undertaken and is pretty much exactly the same across every single coronavirus strain out there. And at that point, there were hundreds of coronavirus strains that had been detected. All of them had this particular... Um, uh, non-structural protein as part of their genome that was similar and was uh, able to be disrupted by molnupiravir. And so at the time, the thinking was, okay, well, if this drug works to inhibit replication among all these coronaviruses, it's almost certainly going to work against a future coronavirus. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. <laughs> it's exactly what happened. The, the scientists, and I, I cover this in my book, the scientists took a bet that molnupiravir and another drug, remdesivir, which we all know well, um, could uh, in, uh, interrupt viral replication across all known coronaviruses and across all future coronaviruses. To me, it was likened by, um, by Ralph Barrick, one of the scientists who was leading this effort. You know, if you know, it's like an encyclopedia. You have a, an encyclopedia of coronaviruses. And if you know that it works against volume one, and if you know that it works against volume 50, then you're pretty sure that everything that's going to come in the future is going to fall within those volumes and will also be vulnerable. I noticed hydroxychloroquine was not on your list there. <laughs> no, no, it was not. It was not. And, um, you know, I covered the, the sort of vagaries of the hydroxychloroquine um, trial in the book as well, speaking with uh, a scientist that led the hydroxychloroquine clinical trial in the United States, you know, and this is an example of uh, a drug for which there was no good scientific evidence to suggest that it worked. There were some, you know, very, very poor, poorly executed um, preliminary studies that suggested that maybe it could be effective. Um, and so Davy Smith, who undertook the hydroxychloroquine clinical trial in the States, thought that, you know, this is something that's very readily available even though there's no evidence that it exists, people are gonna use it because it's got a pretty high um, you know, safety profile. Uh, and people have to, you know, we need to test it only you know, probably to demonstrate that it isn't effective. Now in the middle of the trial, he suddenly got his world turned upside down by President, then President Trump suddenly declaring that it was a game changer 
and that hydroxychloroquine was going to be made available to everyone who needed it, and then it was going to turn the tide of the um, the pandemic. And and what happened in the aftermath to Dr. Smith's work and the trial, uh, you know, it was just absolute mayhem. Hmm. Let me ask you about the scientists that you followed who were committed to this notion of open science. And I'm wondering how much success they had in those efforts. Yeah, um, so there's two scientists of note. Um, the first I would say is, is Bob Brunham, who was part of Canada's uh, vaccine task force. Uh, and was one of the most consequential scientists working around SARS. So Brunham was uh, the director of the BC um, Center uh, for Disease Control at the time in Vancouver when SARS emerged. And he was part of a team that first mapped the SARS genome. And at the time, it was this incredible, incredible accomplishment because mapping genomes took uh, weeks, months, if not years. And uh, Dr. Brunham and his colleagues were able to do it in just a matter of about two weeks. And you know, going back to the test that uh, Ian Lipkin produced, this PCR test, that PCR test was programmed on the genome map that Dr. Brunham uh, produced. And, and Lipkin describes the work of Dr. Brunham and his colleagues at UBC as a heroic effort. And in fact, you know, what's amazing is that when they announced their um, findings that they had mapped the genome, this, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, one of the best funded bodies doing this work uh, in the world, uh, announced their, that they had mapped the genome 24 hours later. So this small group in Vancouver actually beat the U.S. CDC in mapping the genome. Hmm. Now, in the wake of um, mapping the genome, Dr. Brunham wanted to kind of capitalize on that and had this vision of creating a um, decentralized open science vaccine initiative called uh, SAVI. It was called the SARS Accelerated Vaccine Initiative. And it worked on an open science principle where nothing would be patented. And it was decentralized to speed things up. And, and at the time, you know, vaccine production took about 10 years, if you were lucky, to get one from sort of um, conception to the market. And Dr. Brunham thought, well, I, I think we can do this in like 18 months. Um, so he produced this or, or developed this, um, this vaccine initiative where there were multiple groups, multiple laboratories, all working on different vaccine initiatives, different vaccine um, uh, candidates. And whoever landed on the right candidate, it didn't matter because everybody would, would share in the spoils. It didn't matter whether your lab specifically landed on the right candidate. And in that way, in that kind of like holistic, comprehensive and open way, they were able to generate three really, really impressive vaccine candidates for SARS. Um, now, the problem was they had to wait to get it into human clinical trials. To do that, they had to wait for another SARS wave. And ironically, because Dr. Brunham and his team had mapped the genome, which allowed the production of this incredible PCR test to detect SARS, that had allowed public health officials to completely reduce the outbreak and eventually drive SARS back to the wild. And so the excellence of Dr. Brunham's initial mapping of the genome meant that there was no future waves of SARS. And without future waves of SARS, there were no uh, humans to test the vaccine on. And unfortunately, that is the key reason why that open science vaccine initiative never got off the ground. Um, but it wasn't because the idea wasn't a good one. And in fact, you know, nowadays when we look at vaccine distribution, we can see, or, you know, for the COVID-19 vaccines, there's still under 15% of people in low-income countries that have had one dose. Right. One dose. Hmm. And so the notion that the vaccines are going to end the global pandemic has been shown to be totally wrong. I mean, it's, again, the cruelty of the open market uh, of the for-profit market has just created conditions by which we have a complete, you know, uh, uh, dist distinction between what's happening in rich countries and what's happening in low-income countries. And unfortunately, it's only through open science and, uh, you know, open, non-patentable, um, non-for-profit um, approaches that we're going to be able to see vaccine uh, equity. And that is key to ending the pandemic for everyone. Indeed. Dan, I wonder, let, let's just finish up on this. You know, scientists have been, well, they have really thrown themselves into the whole moonshot thing, and we have 
as you just pointed out, brought this thing to market, numerous uh, different uh, brands of vaccines uh, that might have taken a decade, instead took much less time. Do you think there will also be residual knowledge uh, that has come forward as a result of our fight against coronaviruses that can be used for other things in the future? Absolutely. So, you know, on the one hand, directly, we have tested now these antivirals against coronaviruses, and we now see that they're effective against yet the latest SAR, uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. So that sets us up well, if there is a future coronavirus pathogen that emerges, um, to use antivirals immediately and early to ensure that outbreaks don't spread. Okay, so that's that's number one. The, the other way is that I think... Um, it, it, the the knowledge and the the safety and efficacy data that has come particularly from mRNA vaccines is instantly translatable to efforts to create vaccines elsewhere. And in fact, just today, Moderna uh, released some really, really promising results for an HIV vaccine, which uses mRNA technologies. Mm -hmm. So you're already seeing this blowback into HIV, one of the most difficult to vaccinate against viruses that we know. Um, you know, I've also spoken with scientists who have suggested specifically on the on the issue of HIV, which is, you know, of course, a massive pandemic for which we have no vaccine, that the work around developing a COVID-19 vaccine has moved HIV vaccinology forward 10 years. So there's all this incredible eruption of scientific discovery and exploration and all these new tools and technologies that have been validated that can immediately be put to good use against other uh, uh, viruses. Of course, we need to be focused on the future, right? And we need to be focused on not only the viruses that currently bedevil our species, but also those that are yet to emerge. Just curious, did you get it? The vaccine? No, COVID-19. Oh, uh, I, I don't think I did, yeah. I mean, I was very, uh, I was very cautious, but you know, nowadays that doesn't really mean much with the uh, infectivity of, of, of Omicron, but I, I have, as far as I can tell, not been infected with it. This is a weird follow-up question, but given what you do for a living, is there a small part of you that kind of wishes you did get it just so you could experience <laughs> what it is you've been studying for so long? Well, I'll, I'll, I, I guess there is a little bit of curiosity there. I mean, it was interesting speaking with people like Ralph Barrick, who is the world's greatest coronavirus uh, uh, scientist. You know, he had been studying coronaviruses since the 1980s. And I asked him what it felt like when SARS first emerged, you know, this is something that he'd been studying for 20 years at the time, and which was just like a laboratory experiment for him. And he said, it was an exhilaration with a sickness in the pit of my stomach, hmm. you know, and I, and I think that's, that's how it sort of felt for him was, you know, this laboratory experiment had suddenly run amok in the wild. Well put. Dan Werb has been our guest. The Invisible Siege, The Rise of Coronaviruses and the Search for a Cure. What a fascinating book. So good of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO tonight, Dan. Many thanks. Thanks for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.